you started off in a completely different political uh, guise. You were uh, very much on the left, weren't you? And I, I just want to talk about anti-Semitism and racism there. Mm. This is one of the big, obviously, issues of our time, the apparent inability of the Labour Party oh, yes. to deal with this particular issue. Unwillingness, inability, call it what you want. Um, I just wonder, Melanie, when you were on the left, were you in the Labour Party? or? I, I never joined any political party no, at, no. at all. Um, uh, the only isms to which I subscribe ever, have subscribed ever, are journalism and Judaism. Right, okay. um, I belong by, I never belonged to anything. But I, I very kindly mentioned my earlier books, but um, I wrote a, um, a book which was published uh, in paperback uh, last year by an American publisher called Guardian Angel. This is a, a memoir, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. which is a personal and political memoir. Yeah. But it's basically, it describes the, uh, the reasons why I moved my political position and through that personal story, I believe it tells a story of what happened to Britain and the West yeah. culturally. And along the way, certainly, um, anti-Semitism played quite an important part in that. I just wonder whether it, when, when you were on the left, even though you weren't in a party, whether you experienced left-wing anti-Semitism. I mean, did you see it then? You're talking about the 1970s, really. Yes, I, um, I only saw it tangentially when I was growing up. Um, I, you know, there were occasional remarks made at my family, um, but it was very much a kind of fringe thing. Um, uh, I don't think Jews um, like my like my family, igno you know, uh, they ignored it, and they weren't. It wasn't that they weren't frightened by it. Um, my mother, you know, every Friday night, Jews, Orthodox, uh, traditional Jews, light candles on a Friday night, yeah. the commencement of the yeah. Sabbath, and my mother would draw the curtains, in case anyone saw. Mm. So it's that, and British Jews are always seem very nervous about that, uh, and with some good cause. But I didn't come across anything until I was at The Guardian in 1982. Um, and at that point, um, I, I, I should say I never thought, thought of myself as on the left. Right. I thought I was a liberal. I still think I'm a liberal, a traditional right. liberal. Uh, but I thought at that time that the left and liberals were the same. Yeah, yeah. They all called themselves the liberal left. Yeah. And I thought that was true. I thought they were liberal and they were on the left yeah. and that to be left was liberal. And uh, what happened in 1982, as I describe in Guardian Angel, was that I was an editorial writer. I was a leader writer at The Guardian. And there was a, it, was a, it was a particular period. Um, Israel was engaged in a very controversial war in the Lebanon. Uh, at that stage, I'd never been to Israel. In fact, I never went to Israel until the year 2000, never wanted to go, thought of myself as a British Jew, and Israel was for other, other Jews who were in need. But yeah. Britain was where everything was absolutely fine for yeah. Jews. And I was troubled by the reaction in Britain to this invasion of Lebanon. Mm. I didn't agree with it. I thought it was unwise, and I thought they'd gone in too far, and it was a strategic mistake. But I, it, wasn't my, it wasn't my issue. And out of the woodwork came this idea of the Israeli as the Nazi, mm -hmm. literally the mm -hmm. Nazi. And to me, that was anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And out of the woodwork also came the idea that all you Jews stick together. And I mm -hmm. thought, where did that come from? And I was very troubled that the Guardian was majoring on this war in Lebanon. But at the same time, there was an, a, a, an atrocity in Syria. Uh, President Assad's father uh, caused to be uh, killed between 15 and 40,000 uh, uh, opponents mm. uh, at uh, Hama, I think it was, I've forgotten uh, quite where it was, over the course of a couple of weeks. And that was a few paragraphs on a, fo on a foreign page, buried in the paper, whereas anything that Israel did in the Lebanon was, you know, major front page story yeah. and outrage, editorial, outrage columns. And so I said to my colleagues in all innocence, because I was a different person then, why do we seem to have a double standard? Mm, mm. And they looked at me as if I'd crossed a line. Yeah. And I realized I'd crossed a line. Yeah. I didn't know what the line was, but I knew suddenly I'd crossed it. And they said, well, of course there's a double standard. You don't expect us to judge the developing world by the same standards that we have. The developing world is not brought up as we are to have respect for human life. So we can't judge them by those standards. That's racism. And I said, what? Yeah, yeah. You're telling me that if one is unfortunate enough to be born into the developing world, 
then one does not have the same rights to life and liberty as we do. Yeah. To me, that's racism. Exactly, yeah. To which they said, why are you so upset? We do you, and I become you. I'd stop being we, I become you. Yes. We do you the great honor of assuming that you and the state of Israel, I become the state of Israel, <laughs> which I'd never even been to, yeah. you and the state of Israel have the same concepts that we do belief in life and liberty. So we judge you by our standards. And you tell us that you have higher standards than us, so we should judge you by higher standards. Yeah. And I realized at that point that uh, it's like a shattering moment. Mm. I realized they weren't anti-racist, they were racist. Mm. And I realized there was a double speak in which they told themselves their position was uniquely virtuous, mm. and that anyone who opposed it was uniquely unvirtuous yeah, yeah. by definition. Yeah. That was the line I'd crossed. And that it was, it was like the Soviet Union. It was a mirror language, yes. a mirror morality. And I'd crossed two lines. One, I'd opposed the left. And two, I had defended the Jewish people. And as a, Jew, as a British Jew, you're not allowed to do that. What do you think when you see now MPs, Labour Party resigning yeah. has happened? What, what, what do you feel about it's that? It's a bit late. Mm. I mean, uh, to me, all this, I, I say, it, 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 this first emerged in my mind in 1982, 82. and then it kind of went away in my mm. mind. And it didn't emerge again until the year 2000, when the second, so-called Second Intifada started. Israelis were being blown to smithereens in pizza parlors and in cafes and on buses. And it went uh, effectively to war against the Palestinians in uh, the so-called West Bank to stop it. Thousands of Israelis were killed. And from the word go, in this country, in Britain, Israel was being blamed. And so I started to speak out. And as soon as I started to speak out, I'd never previously spoken on this subject in public or written. It wasn't my thing. I'm a, you know, as a social policy writer. Um, as soon as I spoke out, I became the Jew. And not mm -hmm. only the Jew, but the extreme Zionist warmongering Jew. And once I realized that, I started to read. And once I started to read about the history of the region, I realized not only how ignorant I was, but how the general, generally accepted beliefs about the Middle East conflict were almost completely wrong. And then I realized the enormity of the libel against Israel. And then I began to realize, because defense of the Palestinians and the belief in the oppression of the Palestinians by Israel is kind of the default belief among progressive people, I realized that their entire moral compass had disintegrated. And once I realized that, a lot of other stuff that I've been fighting for years about cultural decline and, and, and the cultural absurdity and the collapse of education and, and, and the, the, the rise of multiculturalism, the inability to say that a liberal society is better than any other, the inability to distinguish between truth and lies, yes. between justice and injustice, it suddenly all made sense. It suddenly all came together. Mm. Um, and so that's why I wrote The World Turned Upside Down, because it was turned upside down. But you've also covered this, you've written a novel recently, haven't you? Yes. And there's a, the Legacy. Yes. And, and the, the, basically you cover a lot of uh, the ground of anti-Semitism in that, don't you? Yes. Um, I wanted to write the novel because um, uh, I've always wanted to write a novel. Yeah. And also I believe there's more truth in novels than anywhere else. Right. Um, unfortunately, what I hadn't realized was that, you know, I, 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 I've had difficulty getting published in Britain for a very long time because people do not this want to publish me. It's sort of me. extraordinary in a way. Sorry, I say that greenly, but it's <laughs> extraordinary considering that you are one of the better known. I'm box columnists. office and publishers don't want to make money out of me because they don't want the views expressed. Yeah. But, that, but that, put that to one side. Yeah. These, both these books, Guardian Angel, my memoir, and The Legacy of the Novel, published in America right. last year. Right. They've had no publicity. Uh, you can't get them in the bookshops in Britain, but you can get them on Amazon. Anyway, The Legacy, um, I, exp I used the novel form to explore um, contemporary anti-Semitism in Britain but also more deeply, and I, I wanted to get into the head of an anti-Semite, um, uh, but also more deeply, I wanted to explore what I have come to believe to be the case, which is the, the fact that you can't escape your identity, however much you may want to. And so my hero, my anti-hero, is a, 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 a person of Jewish ancestry who doesn't want to be a Jew in Britain. And it's a kind of story in which he, he realizes that he can't escape it, and he wants to escape it. 
and he realizes the good things that he's missed by trying to escape it. And mm. he, it's not a satisfactory situation yeah. and it can't be made okay. But that's what I wanted to explore, the pull of history, the inevitability of your identity, the, the, the historical, um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the fact that anti-Semitism is the longest hatred, it never goes away. So my book is set on not exactly a small canvas, <laughs> it's set apart from being in contemporary Britain, it's also set in medieval Britain and in Holocaust Poland and in contemporary Israel and America. Right. So it's a you know, modest canvas. Okay. Um, but I wanted to explore this mm. idea that mm. these things are, are, they go through generations. Yes. Um, and um, I don't know, I mean, on Amazon, people have raved about it. They say it's a compulsive page turner. Um, uh, so compulsive, nobody has reviewed it. 